Hi all, uh, I'm Tim, or Vulcan I guess more often uh, during this weekend of the year anyway. And uh, if you were here to see the, the CFT, or CTF, <laughs> Uh, talk with uh, the last 20 years of, of organizers, which incidentally is, is all the years. So uh, um, we have uh, from the beginning all the way to the, the ones that are currently organizing it up here on the, on the panel. And um, I believe the current organizers are, this is the last one, right? Yeah, so, so stepping down this year and every uh, few years the, the current organizers step down and there's um, some process for passing the baton. and. Uh, one of the reasons that, that this talk is on the on the docket this year is to um, answer questions of people that think they might want to step up and take the baton and also to, to have sort of a, a, an archival reference for, for when this happens in the future. Um, so uh, again, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm going to um, do my best to uh, moderate uh, these folks up here uh, when we get to the panel time, but I'm also going to uh, sort of lay a foundation of uh, um, sort of the basics of what uh, CTF is. I'm not going to try and make too many assertions. Now, uh, I am sort of inherently biased being one of the organizers for a few years and also being a participant for a few years, um, but I'll make uh, every effort to, um, to, to sort of remain neutral up here and pass the questions off to, to our panel of, of experts here. Now, the talk is geared towards um, organizing CTF, so I'll do a little bit of explaining about what CTF is, but it's from an organizer perspective, right? And some of us even do CTFs from time to time uh, professionally. Uh, but in most cases, these slides are, are geared specifically to what, uh, what CTF means uh, in the context of DEF CON. <clears throat> so uh, what is CTF, right? <clears throat> so we're not going to cover uh, what is CTF in depth, but uh, at, at the basics, it's a cybersecurity-based uh, capture the flag contest, right? So it's just like flags and you play uh, with hills and kids and stuff. Except the, the flags are digital, uh, also called an exercise or, or an event or a game. Um, typically it's all geared towards demonstrating some uh, minimum bar of proficiency or ideally some bar of excellence in fields of, of cybersecurity. So there's different models for, for organizing this um, and uh, we'll go over a couple of them. Uh, in a bit, but they sort of stress different things. And as an organizer, you get to decide how you're going to stress the, the different uh, sort of areas of excellence. Um, CTF exercises are becoming uh, much more common. So these days, you can almost play about every other weekend uh, if you're okay playing in these remote competitions that happen all over the world. So there's a, a, a circuit, um, so to speak. And um, there's also a, a multitude of contests that sort of just tack on CTF at the end where it's very domain specific, like the um, <clears throat> social engineering CTF or uh, um, ICS CTF or something like that. And some of those bear more resemblance to the game that we're gonna talk about today than others. Um, but uh, in some cases, this really just means contest. In other cases, there are actually flags that uh, could be captured. So going all the way back to the basics, uh, if we're capturing the flag, we need to talk about like what the flag is, right? Well, it's the thing that needs to be captured, but from an organizer's perspective, that actually has, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot to sort of suss out there. Um, is it just random text? Well, if you just use random text, then from a participant's perspective, it's difficult to understand whether uh, you've actually found the flag or whether it's just uh, actually random text, right, that's uh, encrypted or compressed or something like that. So it's, it's somewhat difficult to know when you're done and when you found the flag. Um, from a, I, also from an organizer perspective, it might result in a lot of guessing because the participants are unsure. So you end up with this sort of um, denial of service sort of situation where people are just guessing repeatedly, hoping that they found the flag, but they're not really sure. Uh, so then the, the next thing you do is you try and add some structure, you know, it's a certain size, it's a certain format, it has a particular prefix. Um, all of these things sort of limit that space of brute forcing, right? So now you can you increase the, the likelihood of guessing correctly for people that do want to guess. Um, you also open the door to all kinds of, of different defenses, like consider writing a, a, an IDS signature for, uh, for the prefix that you know is going to be there because the flag has a specification. Um, so there's these uh, trade-offs that happen when you even de define something as basic as what is a flag. <clears throat> yeah, that's broken. Um, 
So uh, even beyond defining sort of the specification for what a flag is, there's a, um, a, a lot of other mechanics that happen around the flag. So if flags are stolen, you sort of have to prove that you've, you've actually stolen it, right? So you have to go back and assert to the organizers that you've successfully stolen it. And over the years, that has really matured uh, over time from um, uh, verbal or writing on paper to email to uh, now you have sort of rich, ish web APIs, right? You solid services where there's structure and, and protocols around how to uh, sort of automatically or in an automated fashion um, submit flags to uh, web APIs or scoreboard servers. Um, and then there's all these sort of game decisions that have to be made, some of them made by the participants where flags might be shared. Um, uh, you have collusion between teams uh, for poten uh, potential collusion. Um, do flags have a, a preset, predefined constant value, or do, does it change over time, maybe being diluted as more people have stolen flags from easier services? Um, do flags expire? If you steal one at the beginning of a 48-hour period, is it worth the same amount at the end of the 48 period? Is it worth anything? Um, all of these things sort of go into the mechanics of how that particular game is going to operate and uh, adjust the game strategies that the participants are going to uh, adopt. So then what is DEF CON CTF uh, specifically? Well, there's no shortage of quotes. These are just ones from the top hits when you do a Google search, but um, the assertion that I think most of the people up on this panel would say is that DEF CON is one of the, the highest regarded uh, CTFs out there, right? And uh, it's kind of grown over the years from being one of the, the oldest and uh, sort of the, one of the only uh, to being uh, the, the World Series uh, or the best of the best, right? Um, so typically the phrase DEF CON CTF, if you hear somebody say it, they're referring specifically to the, the on-premise uh, version of the game which starts tomorrow morning, right? At 9 a.m. and goes till Sunday, right? It goes throughout the weekend. Um, so in the beginning, uh, there were the goons, or more specifically, there was Miles, right? And um, so DEF CON uh, CTF is one of the oldest and longest running. Uh, there are some others that have been around for, uh, for a while, um, like the UCSB's ICTF comes to mind. Um, but even ICTF is, is fairly restricted until just uh, this year was sort of academic only, right? And they, they opened up for you guys, right? So as a, as a pre-qualifier for this year, uh, they, they opened it up so it's not academic affiliated. But, but DEF CON's got a long history of being uh, very approachable and, and very open. And um, it's one of the, the longest running CTFs. It's also one of the oldest contests that's still running uh, at DEF CON. Um, so back at DEF CON 4 uh, was the first one. It was just called Capture the Flag or Network Capture the Flag, I think a little bit later. And um, <clears throat> it has certainly grown uh, over time. So while this is DEF CON 25, it's CTF uh, 22. Uh oh. There we go. <laughs> Um, so if you look at a, a quick uh, timeline, again, in the beginning there were goons. Um, sort of later on, uh, teams more formally organized and sort of had a multi-year approach to, <laughs> to organizing. <laughs> we may switch different computers yet. Um, so around the year 2000, it was clear that organizing needed to be a team sport. Let's go back one and see. It's less, less epilepsy. Um, <laughs> Now, not CTF, now with less, less epilepsy. <laughs> um, sort of around uh, 2000, it was clear that organizing needed to be a team sport, right? Uh, there were other hacking competitions. Um, Hope, for example, had something, but there was nothing that really had uh, sort of the network to comp component, the defensive component. <clears throat> Got one more, let's see if this will last, no? All right. So in the way of a roadmap, which might stay there for a few seconds, nope. <laughs> um, let's go back and forth here. Can try turning it off and on. Quick, look at it. Uh, so in the, way, in the way of a roadmap, <clears throat> um, there's sort of different milestones that, that happened over the years. Uh, in the beginning, hey, Tim, there were- can I interrupt you for a second? Sorry? Just me? Just me. Uh, I just wanted to say, he's had two problems here that are totally classic what happens yeah. every year when you come with new technology. <laughs> and new technology. every year with organizing these contests, 
we don't know necessarily who's going to be in the audience, what words to use to say, to talk, to make things work right. And we definitely don't know what cables to bring. <laughs> uh, but they do provide testing harnesses in the speaker room, which work fine. It's fixed. You had to go kick the cable, apparently. It's, it's unfixed. Yeah, it might. There's so much in between here and there. He puts his hat on. Yeah, right. Yeah, we'll just we'll just skip over it. The uh, there's sort of different milestones that happen throughout the years, right? There's there's the the realization that teams are going to be competing, right? Even though it wasn't necessarily organized as a as a team competition. There's the realization that teams are required for organizing, right? It's too much for one individual or a couple of individuals to handle. Um, fast forward to there's so many people that want to play that there needs to be some sort of qualifying round in order to date the people that can actually make it to what's now known as the finals or the DEF CON CTF that's on premise. And then uh, the sort of different things that happen uh, sort of along the way, like the inclusion of the game outside the game with the, the meta game and uh, moving to IPv6 and, and badges that have uh, game code on the badges. Uh, and then last year was actually the first year and perhaps the only year that the, the architecture and the, the format of the game were announced like long ahead of time. So you could actually spend time developing tools as a team and come in with tools that you knew were gonna work, right? We actually, we actually announced last year that we were having a, a custom architecture. It's like a nine bit Middle Indian thing, monstrosity. Middle Indian is not actually a thing, by the way. No, no. <laughs> no it totally is now. It, could be, it, it totally is, is now. now. Yeah. yeah, it is now. Uh, so yeah, now we actually have a completely custom architecture that the team just got this morning. They just got this yeah. manual this morning. So, so preparation before 9 a.m. is perhaps of limited utility, right? <laughs> um, so getting back to, to what is Capture the Flag, if we kind of grossly break them down into two categories, this has again been covered in, in other presentations so we won't spend too much time on it, but the two broad categories are, are Attack, Defend, and uh, Game Board or Jeopardy style. And the big thing in Attack, Defend is that the participants are directly connected to each other, so defense actually becomes a big component of the game. Uh, also, service level availability, or SLA, uh, becomes part of the game. The, the, the parts that uh, need to be vulnerable and able to be attacked have to be there and running. Um, so everybody's typically level set. Uh, think of like a VM that has custom software and it's sort of distributed to all the teams. There's different ways to do that, but that's a, a good analogy. And uh, ultimately, it's composed of a set of challenges. And that's another thing that matured over time, the, the concept of challenges or services. And these are uh, sets of custom software that uh, typically run with some amount of concurrency. Um, there's debate on, on how many challenges uh, concurrently make a good CTF or not. So uh, conversely, the, the Jeopardy style is much like the show. Right? You've seen the show. It's a grid of questions. Um, participants are not connected to each other, so defense is typically uh, um, not part of these games. And you solve a series of challenges where the order might be determined or might be, say, controlled by the leader, by the organizer. And the categories might be completely arbitrary or they might be designed with uh, certain you know, learning objectives or goals, such as gating for, for CTF, demonstrating proficiency in, in subjects that, that would uh, work well when you get here for the weekend. There's also hybrids and things that don't quite fit, but broadly these are the two. Um, so Jeopardy style worldwide, uh, or just proportionally in the number of CTFs that happen is, is by far the most common. Um, it's uh, possibly more diverse within a single event because defining what a question is uh, is very broad, uh, whereas you define what a software service is in an attack defend game is perhaps relatively uh, confining. Um, and it's arguably easier to, to organize for, for several reasons. So, so today, uh, DEF CON, well, when you say DEF CON CTF, it means the thing here. Uh, there's typically a Jeopardy style one that, that dates everybody as a qualifying round. Um, so this was introduced in uh, 2004, Caesar. You did qualifying, right? Uh, it turns out, yeah. yeah, yeah we, were, right. we, were actually we were just debating that. that. Yeah. No, Caesar was like, we didn't do quals. I was like, I remember playing in your quals, yeah. so I'm so the pretty last, sure you did. The last year, it, it, so on the, on the chart it should show, but you can't see it because it causes epilepsy. Uh, but I think the last year that the Ghetto Hackers <laughs> ran started quals. Yeah, and and that, was all, that was all DD back in the day. Like, that was literally like actually, force of one. Yeah. Although Miles uh, brought us along, DD implemented so much stuff. It, you really would have to understand the guy to know yeah. how amazing he could pump out 
uh, user mode Linux router system with double right. NAT and firewalling and stuff like yeah. in a night, in an yeah. evening. Yeah, so, they, they also had some pretty crazy constraints in their quals too. Like I, I remember specifically playing and, and not being able to actually make any oh, kind really? of connection into that box or out of that box other than the literally just yeah, terminal IO. Really and so we had to write like GU encoder and decoder routines into like Telnet so that we could like move binaries to the box. Yeah. Yeah. The, their first quality was just a race to finish eight, eight levels of a challenge. Yeah, was it, yeah, it was totally questions. linear. Oh, yep. yeah. yeah, exactly. <clears throat> So we're having a sad realization up here that it, anything with pictures appears to anger the projection system, uh, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of pictures in this. <laughs> so, um, so you've seen the board. This is what the board looked like when, when DD Tech, or sorry, when uh, Ken Shoto uh, had quals in 2006 anyway. And uh, there's a starter question. There's a hint that kind of points off somewhere, either download a file or go to some uh, web service. And... Uh, Maybe I should try and switch computers here. Uh, but unlike Jeopardy, uh, so the leader controls the next question, but unlike Jeopardy, uh, other uh, teams can sort of catch up and answer the, uh, the previous questions. Uh, I might just try and switch briefly here. We can probably fill the space. Yeah, go for it. We're going to talk about stuff while he works. <laughs> That's usually how organizing CTF is. I was going to say, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty ad hoc to begin with. Okay. Basically, something, something goes awry every time. This, this, is own, this is its own sort of like micro example of how CTF actually works in real life. Because it turns out nothing goes to plan. It's the old, like, you know, planning is useful, but plans are useless kind stories. of thing. And I'll point stories. out that Tim was a part of DD Tech, and DD Tech's CTS were famously broken. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was one year, I think you completely erased the scores from one day. Yeah, we were, oh, yeah, we were upset right. with that. Yeah. 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 And yeah. actually, uh, playing CTF, uh, most of my CTF experience was under DD Tech, and my two black badges is from winning their first and final year. Um, but funny story, actually, we were playing quals, or organizing quals, uh, I once wrote a, a mock web server with a CGI script underneath it, and uh, there's a debug within the CGI script, but all this, the web script kiddies were like, yay, a web challenge! <laughs> and then, uh, so they started uploading like PHP shells and Python shells, and <laughs> one team in particular uploaded a Python shell <coughs> connect back with a hard-coded IP address and port. So I'm like, huh, let me play with this. So I killed it, since it wasn't actually part of the game, or necessarily part of the game, and they did it again. All right, this is what's going to happen. Killed it, just immediately started connecting back to them. And then uh, finally got to connect back, and they started typing commands. And me trying to like, ls, like, uh, slash. And then, like, you know, cat something. Like, uh, let me type some other crap. Eventually, I realized they were talking to somebody. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so much, yeah, it took, it took an amazing amount of so like, like, self control yeah. to not mess with everybody yeah. else's exploits, essentially. Like, yeah. people would land stuff on boxes, and, like, watching it happen, you could, like, connect to it faster than they could. And so, like, not going and grabbing everybody else's shells when you're the organizer just for fun well, so was actually, like, a massive, massive self-control. The reason I did it, though, <laughs> is because it wasn't necessary to, to land the challenge. Right. So that was actually the year. So I don't know if you guys know Geohot. He popped the service by figuring out that .bash RC was writable by general users. <laughs> so he wrote cat uh, flag in the, out to slash tip slash something. So he just waited until somebody else exploited it because they were just going to run bash because when you run bash, whatever. And so he just waited and just saw that file pop up in temp and got the flag. That's the way to do it. He's we actually way to, way to, we I actually did. had a whole we had a whole um, we had a whole like sub like focus area that we that we called the dirty tricks department, which yeah. was basically like trying to figure out all the all the errant conditions in everybody else's exploitation methodology. So like I remember one year there was a team that was doing really really well, but they were always like their payload would actually cat the flag to a file in temp, mm -hmm. and so we could just like walk around behind them and mop up all the flags that they were getting to. Nice. But one thing I found that was, uh, was going? Never mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm right. gonna finish your thought. I don't, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> too, too much of a thought. Yeah, you're, you're in the middle of your thing, go ahead. Um, I will say that I walked into the, the speaker room earlier today with my uh, laptop that's running Linux and plugged it in and everything worked. And then I didn't tell anybody. I was like, oh, Linux, and it finally works. It understands how to do this. It's the year so of Linux on the desktop. So then I went back later, and I tried it again, and it worked again. <laughs> and then I got up here, and I'm like, oh, no. And now I have a Mac plugged into the projector, and it's working fine. Um, so I guess it's still not Go there. back and show your timeline. I thought that was a, that was a good yeah. idea. You should put back to your timeline. Yeah, agreed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nobody got to see that. You can go left, right, right? Quick before you into it. Yeah, I'm a few slides <laughs> down now. Um, Great. So now we have timelines with no epilepsy. 
Um, so uh, I, I kind of went over a few of the um, the parts, and this is by no means exhaustive. It's just sort of like the things that, that stood out in in, in, uh, in my memory and sort of uh, it worked well for the slide deck, right? <laughs> um, but uh, it definitely has a lot of the, the pieces that matured over time with the, the qualifier uh, introduced in, in 2004, and then the, the tradition that continues now with returning the, the returning champion. So uh, so Ken Shoto would be inviting the returning champion back for the first time in 2005. And there, there's sort of these, uh, I don't know, um, dirty, dirty tricks or, or twists or things that sort of make it hard to um, uh, come in prepared, right? So like one of the things that this year makes it hard to come in prepared is that it's an entirely custom architecture that wasn't announced until 9 a.m. this morning, right? So that's like a, a way that preparation is, is difficult. Um, some other examples of that going back in 2006, you had to submit keys over a DTMF. We were just talking about that too. I remember. I remember basically everybody. So we had we had deployed like a an actual like I think it was an asterisk. Asterisk. Yeah. yeah. And so basically all the tokens, all the keys were just you know really big, entirely numeric digits. And so we were making everyone like they would pick up a phone and it was like press one to submit a key, press two to talk to a member of Kinshota. And so basically all the teams had to like run out into Vegas trying to like buy modems and like had to like write their own little like DTMF like you know scripts to submit tokens because otherwise yeah. the first few tokens that were being submitted by people they were first of all they were like thirty two digit numbers like they were big and everybody's like beep, 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 beep. <laughs> shit I fucked it up. <laughs> you have to so, physically hang out. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, and you couldn't submit more than one token per call, so you had to actually hang up the phone and do it again. <laughs> we, we had so many has. tokens, we exceeded the available bandwidth to submit our tokens. We couldn't submit it fast enough. Yep. Yeah, so everybody ran out. Everybody ran out to Fry's to buy to try and find modems. And Which like, also has like, and like people were like, how, how do I connect something over serial to my like modern laptop? Which also has like interesting ramifications because then next year. Like teams would buy out all the modems, like yeah, just in yeah. case. And right? then we didn't use modems next yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good, they have good return policies. <laughs> they do. Uh, but there's there's other things that sort of uh, go through the times. Uh, multiple hosts, uh, IPv6. Uh, a lot of people were um, sad faced when it was all IPv6, and they had a lot of IPv4 tools and shell code and so forth. Um, so custom, uh, so MSP430 architecture on the badges, sort of midway through uh, legit BS, and, and then again this year with the custom architecture. So these are sort of the, some of the uh, milestones. By no means exhaustive, um, but um, as I already said, the one that I want to focus on now is the, the qualifying round because that gets into the the style that of game. Uh, that's Actually, game before style. you jump off that slide, can I can I like mention one other thing? Yeah, I think there's an interesting pattern that's shown uh, as a result of this slide. Which is the like burnout cycle of hosting CTF. If you notice, almost all of those are the same ish, like maybe off by one year here and there or whatever, because the just Herculean level of effort that goes into creating CTF in general literally causes like internal drama and burns out teams over time. It's a second job. Like, it's it's, it's literally so like job. our as an example during during Kinshoto CTF, we had you know full time jobs and actual real life stuff to do besides you know CTF, and then had an eight month development cycle yeah. every year. For, for CTF, and by the end of it, we were just like, nope, not doing this how again. Many, how many hours a week did you guys work? Oh my god, it was it was literally a second full time job for almost the entire team. Wow. We had Didi, so we went <laughs> like four hours a week. I know, right? And he worked. And you guys were like, Didi, go do a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do this week? So, uh, what's lightning, our contest like? Uh, right. Lightning, who wrote the uh, architecture for this, started in 2015. Yeah. So, um, to be fair, it took until a lot longer. <laughs> um, so if you kind of uh, fast forward, uh, the previous slide showed a Ken Shoto board from 06. Here's another one from 08. I think maybe even the same code or the same style was used in 2007. It looks very similar anyway. Um, but you can see that the, the board is, is, is sort of uh, um, staying the same, static, uh, as Ken Shoto evolved. Um, you, you do get to define sort of the areas of excellence in the categories. Um, there, there's a, a, an aspect that the organizer will have to decide of how approachable do you want the, the, the open qualifier. Anybody can sign up, right? So how approachable do you want it to be for novice players? So typically that's solved with a, sort of a trivia category and, uh, and also the, the lower point value ones uh, where they're, they're very approachable to... Uh, approachable enough that, that for all the years we hosted at the Trivia 100 had the same answer. <laughs> it was, well, it was... There you go. <laughs> it was literally hack the blank, so, blank uh, the planet. The last hack. Which, 
Which right. we can <laughs> and, and our last version was blank, blank, blank. blank. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they they submitted a version blank, 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 and people just submitted hack the planet. Yeah. We actually have a we have a baby's first category now. Yeah. So it's all like baby's first heap exploit. Yeah, yeah. So through the years, so here's uh, the next uh, set of organizers, DD Tech. Um, obviously a different uh, look and feel, but but very similar, really? very uh, similar <laughs> semantics. It's still Jeopardy, it's still categories. Um, you're still choosing the area of excellence, so to speak. So it's, when you go around to other talks, um, it's, it's sort of all the same things, right? Crypto, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows, heap overflows, right? The, the, the box is open to, to any of the security-related uh, fields. Um, and then the, the current organizer, right, um, have a, a slightly more Japanese game show. Right? This is one of the, er the earlier ones from uh, 2013. Um, but the concept of qualifying the teams through this gate has, has persisted since it started. It really uh, filters down to the, the handful of teams that are going to be present here uh, do you guys at know, DEF CON. Do you guys know, anybody, anybody who's been an organizer and stuff, do you guys know like offhand the total number of like I actually clicked I am beginning yeah. to play quals? Because those if numbers are impressive. We'll get that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I should have said at the beginning that, that I made these slides and they haven't actually seen them, so there might be True some story. disagreement. And I, but I, in, the, <laughs> in trying to be uh, to be honest and, and faithful, I've uh, I've kept everybody in the dark. <laughs> um, so the basic organization of the game is the same, um, has remained the same, and uh, you know other CTS around the world sort of take a similar approach. All they modify like how you get through the board and so forth. So one thing you might have noticed the uh, the astute observer. Through the boards that we've looked at, some of the same teams keep showing up. Like everybody up here and anybody out there that's a team know that. But you see the, the sort of regulars, the familiar faces that come back. And um, teams have really started persisting over time, uh, um, back even when uh, the ghetto hackers were, were playing and then, and then uh, organizing. And uh, these are teams that, that sort of prepare and, and practice and build tools and test tools and, and things year round. So it's, Except it's on for a us, cycle. Not the ghetto. What's that? The ghetto did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of. I mean, a few hours a week. We, we, so, we drank a lot. I didn't say you had DD. So. I said that teams <laughs> exist that do it. Um, so they develop and maintain tools and teach processes and so forth, and you can sort of track them. These, these are just points in time, so it doesn't say anything about how they, their, their final placing in quals, but you see the same teams kind of over and over, both in quals and, and also at finals. Um, so, so much that, that it's actually tracked somewhat formally now. So this is a, uh, a website called CTF Time. There, there's other ones, but this one has sort of uh, emerged as the, the predominant one. And it, it's sort of mostly opt-in, so it's, you, you might not be as tracked as you want to be, but um, when the, the results are posted publicly, the teams are known, and, and based on you know, pattern matching on the IDs, they're sort of matched together. Uh, but individuals can sort of affiliate with the team and, and opt-in. But uh, um, but these are tracked over time, right? So these teams persist. It's, it's uh, um, for some, it's again a second job kind of situation. Uh, there, there's formulas. There's there's APIs you can use to extract the information and verify that your your rankings are correct. Um, even so, still subjective, right? Somebody's still saying, "Oh, that CTF was harder than this one by some metric," right? And the the, the formula still had to be plugged in. Um, there's still interesting opportunities for cooperation and, and collusion and what happens when you switch teams and all that sort of thing. Um, so how many will participate? Right? So here's, we go back to the, uh, the, the timeline and uh, you can see the, in, the, in the bar graph, I don't know if you can read the numbers very well, but the, the largest bar is 414 and the smallest bar is 162. I didn't have numbers from the, the early Ken days. Yeah, I don't, uh, on I don't how think that worked, we do but, either. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I didn't have them, and then I couldn't find them. So. <laughs> but you can, you can see there's a, a bit of a trend line, right, in the teams. And um, it's important to know, which I think Vizzy was getting at, is how many teams are actually participating, which is vastly different than how many teams registered, right? So I think last year there were 1,500 teams that registered, I think Vito said. So 1,500 teams registered, 276 actually submitted something, right, which isn't a perfect metric. Might, there might be some people that like tried to play and just couldn't figure out Hack the Planet, right? And they didn't submit anything. <laughs> right. It's, it's possible, so it's not a perfect metric. Um, but these, this is a, a good approximation of how many teams are playing, right? Not how many people. Teams can have many people. Uh, they probably have at least eight in most cases, but... Or like um, 50 if you're School of Root. Uh, <laughs> we don't discriminate. There are rules in Equal CTF. opportunity. Um, so you can see it trending up. Um, there, there's sort of other caveats. 
in that uh, registering shadow teams might have some advantage depending on how uh, the game is structured and how flags have value. So having extra teams on your on your team might be useful um, and, and so forth. You can even, in some cases, dilute flag values strategically. So then the, the other flip side of how many will participate, that's how many play in open qualifiers, but how many are actually gonna play when you get uh, to Las Vegas, right? There's logistics and setting up the right amount of tables and how many prizes and uh, what kind of um, orchestration you need to run. So um, when the Ghetto Hacker started, it was eight, right? And it was always eight. And where did eight come from? Um, I think we had, no, it was probably miles. That's how many teams we could fit tables in the room. Okay. Fire code, essentially. It was fire code yeah. and like lines of network. And so we built some really nice PVC structures to run the networking cables, and that's where eight came from. Yep. And my, you guys, my working theory was eight port switch or eight port hub at the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was yeah. never, the, you guys never had, I think we were, I think we ended up being the first ones to like in, implement like a team table limit. I don't think you guys had that, right? Because we, we also saw like the instances of teams, eight or 10 or however many teams were in the ballroom at the time. We would see one table with like three dudes and another table with like literally people like crowded around with laptops and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there were all star fire code considerations there too. <laughs> like the Immunix team. Um, so anyway, you can see that one of the things that DD Tech wanted to do as organizers was expand the competition across uh, several dimensions and one of them was size. So uh, it kind of ramped up a little bit. Uh, the first one should probably have an asterisk in that there weren't actually 10 uh, viable teams. There was one sort of deceptive team. So really only nine teams in the first year. And then the, the last year that DD Tech ran it, there were 20 and that was, that we were sort of gently pushed because it was DEF CON 20 to have 20 teams. Um, and then Legit BS maintained for a little while and has uh, settled on, on 15 in the most recent years. Um, so how many teams you'll support is, an, is another question that you'd have to ask as a uh, as an organizer. All right, so this competition, once you get to Vegas and these 10 teams or 15 teams uh, get here, um, how are you gonna implement this attack defend game, right? So fundamentally, uh, you're gonna be concerned about scoring. There are uh, four, uh, I don't know, here there's four basic components, but there's gonna be basic building blocks, right? There's offense, there's defense. Uh, if you have defense, you probably need some amount of SLA. And then there's this concept of like other points with like bonus points granted via breakthroughs or, or other stuff. So offense is gonna be stealing flags or corrupting flags, right? You can, you, can def you can like take one or you can burn one or whatever. And these have to be combined in some way to come up with a score that you can then use to declare a champion, right? So score might be offense times defense times SLA. That has pros and cons, right? If, if any of those is zero, your total score is zero, so you can drive to zero real quick. So if you have no offense, do you get no points? If you have no defense, do you get no points? Maybe that's the kind of game you wanna run, I don't know. Uh, maybe you do uh, more of a, a summation, right? If you add them all together, now a zero score in any one of them doesn't drive you to zero, but it also doesn't have that big of an effect, so you can have um, slightly more complex formulas where uh, SLA maybe is the multiplier, meaning you have to allow your opponents to play uh, in order to score any points, right? If you have zero SLA, it means nobody can attack you. Nobody else can sort of play the game. So you don't, you want to encourage the game to be played. Um, uh, and then, uh, these need to work over time, right? We have the concept of rounds. You're going to play all weekend. So now this has to be added up over these uh, fixed or, or variable length, five minute, 15 minute rounds, uh, whatever. Um, so now your round score is the summation of these. Uh, um, uh, the round score is the formula and the game score is the summation. And then you might have multiple services, right? These concurrent services, these, these 10 vulnerable things that are running on your host that need to be added together. So maybe you end up with a formula that looks like this down at the bottom. And this is by no means like the right formula or even one that'll really work well, but you kind of get the idea that there, there's some uh, mechanics to go into devising the formula that you need to um, have the score. And there's value in, in having this well-defined ahead of time. Many other methods. Um, once you even have these formulas figured out, you need to measure it all, right? So you have uh, SLA, uh, so this might be a port scanner, but now they're like much more robust polling, right? And uh, that's very uh, service specific, testing different code paths. Um, if a flag is corrupted for offense, the organizers need to tell somehow. Um, there's, there's a lot of sort of game uh, uh, strategies around uh, sort of permanently overriding other people's flags and things like that. Um, so modern CTFs employ custom kernels and, and hypervisors and, and traps and all of these things in order to detect that our override has happened. 
similar protections for reads. And then defense is sort of the absence of offense, right? You must be doing good because nobody's successfully attacking you. So none of this is set in stone. Every year there's new opportunity to revise and come in with, with new scoring methods. Um, there are more questions here that, that uh, um, will need to be answered, right? Will there be bonus points? Uh, will the scores always increase? How important is offense and so forth? Some of the important parts about what you're saying, um, like uh, some of the formulas he was just talking about, if I turn off my computers and start hacking, then the game's over, right? It's no fun. Uh, it, it really is difficult to convince security people to do blue team when they're here for a red team contest. Uh, that, that figuring out how to game things has been the evolution of the game, really t making it fun. Absolutely. To sure. That's the, the whole dirty tricks department. Yeah. I mean, we had, we had dudes like basically going and like, so when we were playing, our dirty tricks department was doing stuff like we had a guy that uh, did physical pen testing for a living. Like his, he was the guy who talked his way into data centers and did all that kind of thing. And so he had like a high end tie. He was, you know, ex-military, whatever. So he'd roll around in like camo and like, you know, camo pants and like a, you know, DEF CON, like DEF CON regulation black shirt or whatever. And he would actually like never ever talk to us. We would send someone away from the table to like make drops and like meet with him. <laughs> who he was rolling around doing things like brushing a CD off, like brushing burned CDs off of someone else's table, and he had like duct tape rolled in a loop on the bottom of his shoe, and he would walk with a limp so that he wouldn't like stick it down, but like a camo guy walking with a limp, like, you know, no big deal. So he would literally go by tables, brush sure. CD-ROMs off, stick them to the bottom of his shoe, and walk away with them. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There, there's many colorers to that. <laughs> um, so these services that are running concurrently, you need to define. You need to define how much you're going to define them. Right? Is there a spec for this? Like, how, what kind of a box are they going to fit in? The more of a specification you have for a service, the easier it is to uh, to automate and to test and deploy and to redeploy and to rebuild and also to outsource. It turns out because if you have a spec, you can get tell somebody to write against the spec. If it's an if it's an open box, you might come back with something that's really hard to, to organize around. Um, but lots of decisions about how many are going to run, what's their point value, and so forth. Um, you need to decide how teams are going to interact with the infrastructure. So they're connected together. There's some way that they're interacting with each other. Um, but they're also going to have to, to interact with all of the, the, the bits and pieces that you've assembled and created. Um, so that, will they operate their own defended host? Is it a VM? Uh, will they route through the table? Right? Do they have an uplink that's on the table? Do they get a tap? Is the tap delayed? And so forth. There's lots of uh, um, decisions that have to be made about how the, the game is going to be represented and how it's going to be interfaced with. Um, one thing that I think, I think everybody, another thing that's continued over time is having a, a, an immense um, desire to protect the integrity of the game. Right, and there's lots of ways that you can you can take that to heart and, and infer. Um, Specifically, it needs to be that. just hackable enough. <laughs> right, right. It's inherently. I mean, it's already a hostile network. Right, it's already hostile people. Uh, it's designed to be vulnerable. Right, uh, but you want to have a fair game. You want to make sure that when you're crowning a champion, you're sure that that's the champion. It was the right person. You're confident in your scoring. You're confident in your infrastructure. Um, so there's there's lots of different pieces to that. This is another slide that's by no means exhaustive. Um, but you want to take, uh, I think that at least up until now, there's been extreme measures taken to protect the integrity of the game. Um, and the non-technical side, there's, there's even things about like table positioning, right? Is it unfair to put one table sort of like with their backs to the door when you open in the room? Um, is it unfair to give one, one team a particular ID that might result in nulls in their shellcode because of their network subnet and things like that, right? So <laughs> you really want to have, um, strive to be fair. Who did that exactly? <laughs> So uh, when, we, when we designed a, uh, uh, that custom badge you mentioned, uh, unfortunately, we, so we gave index numbers to people who placed in our qualifier, and PPP got first, so we gave them the zero index. Uh, unfortunately, the zero <laughs> index was not exploitable on the RF network. So that's one, one instance. Like, everybody's got their instance. Oh, for sure. Um, so plan for failure, right? Like, in this case, bring a Mac that also can do your presentation. Um, but then uh, uh, this is the kind of thing where I'm sure we can just go down the table and everybody can talk about the different failures. But uh, one of the failures that happened in, in this picture, I'm pretty sure this is a great picture, was a, a sort of a central scoring database had a hard disk just totally tank like right in the middle of the competition, right? So you have to have uh, ideally some resiliency, uh, some like failover, some backup plans, right? Like a, the, the sort of the game must go on mentality, right? 
Um, so what will the rules be? So I think uh, typically historically the rule is no physical attacks, right? And this is really to, to keep people from physically being hurt, right? This, this is actually there, and I, th I think there's well, good reason also, to have that there. Don't cut our right? cables because we had to do that. Like that would cost us money, so don't cut our stuff. Yeah. So there's there's other things, right? There, there's <laughs> those no were not attacks, the rules when we played. <laughs> it sort of expands into things like don't mess with the infrastructure, right? That's don't destroy personal property, right? Don't <laughs> messing, toss the team. messing with the infrastructure used to be like part of the game. That was the game. That was the game. Yeah. Well, this is we why. hacked we hacked part of the scoring system one time, and basically, yeah. like I remember, I think it was Didi that came up to the table, and he's like. That's really cool. Knock it the fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Did you get? Yeah. Did you receive bonus points for your? Effort? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that was always the thing. Is like you kind of want to reward people for doing something novel and new. I remember. Um, I remember the year that um, we had uh, again, sort of the de facto rule, like don't cut cables, right? Because obviously you could walk around with a razor blade on your shoe and like cut cables all day long. And so one of the things that we had said was, you know, basically denial of service isn't actually that cool, right? So like do something cool. And if you're trying to do something cool and you mess it up, like okay, we'll have a little bit of forgiveness and like. It'll be all right. So I remember, um, I think it was School of Roots Captain John Boss comes up to me, comes up to me, and he's like, "So busy. We were trying to do something really neat. I was standing, kind of the tables were like this, and actually this was a lessons learned. But we had the uh, sort of ring of tables for the uh, for the people running, you know, for Kenshoto in the middle, and the the tables had skirts on sort of both sides, you know, like the hotel does. And so we're standing there next to the table." You remember yeah, this story now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, right. So we're standing there, and this was actually the DTMF year. So we're standing there, and he's like, "So, what if a friend of mine theoretically was trying to do something really cool, but kind of messed it up, and now maybe a team needs a new cable?" And I'm like, "What'd you do?" <laughs> so he's like, "Well, you see," and he lifts up the skirt of the table, and there's a dude underneath our table, like right next to me. And he's like, well, we haven't been able to get him out for like two hours because we managed to get him under there to try and So they had gone and bought a 900 megahertz phone and were trying to wire it into one of the other team's POTS line to literally broadcast whatever tokens they were submitting over like 900 megahertz analog. So they apparently messed up splicing it in, you know, and like, like happens. But then they also couldn't actually find a window to get the guy out from under our table covertly. And so he had been under there for like two hours. <laughs> and so like John, John Boss lifts up the skirt. And he's like, so we've got this dude under your table. And I'm like, <laughs> that about right? that's, that's about it, right? Something like that. Oh yeah, there he is. <laughs> yeah, man. So like, so basically we were like, yeah, that's, that's actually really cool, like, and well played, like, on getting, you know, people under our table. So we just ran a new line and didn't, uh, didn't cause a problem. But basically that whole dirty tricks thing, like, messing with the infrastructure definitely was part of, part um, of our game. And totally unrelated fact, when infrastructure moved to dedicated rooms that may or may not have been in balconies, the rooms locked at some point. <laughs> but the balconies didn't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who was it? Who was it that climbed across from one of the balconies to the other to get into the Kinshoto Skybox one year? I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't think that was School of Route Two. About. Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> um, we're talking about cultural influence, actually. Right before the talk, there are some some bits of culture that are missing from the slide. So again, this is sort of an incomplete slide, but um, culture is, is is interesting in that. Um, there's a lot of, um, of barriers, right, especially as this becomes an increasingly international competition, right? There's teams from, from all around the planet that play not only in quals but also in finals these days. And there's, there's clearly the language barrier, there's clearly a popular culture, like uh, um, the hacker movies from the 80s, like some of them weren't as internationally as popular as others, so like those questions don't resonate as much, right, and those sorts of things. Time zones and holidays, right? Like there, there's, there's different things to try and keep in mind. Um, they tend to show up during uh, trivia and question starters and things on, on the right hand side, just generally when interfacing with the teams and when designing uh, services that have ASCII protocols, right? And the words sometimes have meaning to the different cultures. Um, there's also the, the culture that's influenced by CTF, where the community uh, sort of leaves its mark uh, um, in various ways. So generals and producers and, and actors and, and so forth uh, actually come through and visit the, the CTF room and, and want to have sort of like their own individual uh, briefing and their own sort of explanation. And you have no idea what the ramifications of those conversations are going to be and how that sort of spirals out, right? Uh, so here's a, a, a team mentioned, a school route mentioned in the, the HBO show. Um, another sort of thing that needs to be approached by the organizers is 
um, how are you going to engage everybody, right? Not only the participants, but also the, the folks that are walking around and the average human attendee. So should there be ambiance? Should there be distraction? Should there be attraction? Like, should there be music at all? How loud should the music be? Should there be videos? Should there be scoreboards? Really, really loud. <laughs> uh, there's probably contention up here about that. Um, but, but otherwise, if you don't consider these things, it just ends up being a bunch of people in a fairly dark room staring at computers, right? And uh, the teams don't really have any physical interaction with each other. The attendees don't really know what they're looking at, so handouts and so forth. So this gives way to visualization. So uh, back in, I, I think this is about 2002. I don't really know. I think this is a ghetto-created scoreboard. Yeah, I think it is. Um, but we had uh, scoreboards, right, projected right onto the, the wall. Um, one of, the, one of the problems with showing scores is uh, it can be really easy to get away with a win in the first day, and you might have teams start to lose yeah. interest. And this is part of, you know, do scores always go up? This was part of, uh, this is a zero-sum game, and you can see the teams on the bottom have a little bit of a red bar, and the bigger green bars are the, the top, top games. Yeah. At some point, you're trying to keep people interested, even if in reality they, there's no possible way they can win anymore. I don't know if it was us who started it, but so the first day we show scores, uh, live scores. The second day we only show relative positions, and then finally the third day we just play back the previous. Um, I think there were there were sort of a refinement process on that. We had something where like I think for the last four hours we didn't show the scoreboard, something yeah. like that too. Yeah. 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 I think everybody has your own variation on that theme. I think, you're, I think you're a little bit more extreme than has been in the past. Um, so here's some, uh, some boards kind of through time. Uh, here's a, a Ken Shoto board with the, the ordering and the, the team uh, relative placement on a line chart over, over time. Um, a little bit later, still a very similar scoreboard. Uh, even later in the Ken Shoto time, we still have a similar scoreboard, but it's also rotating with ones that have um, uh, I guess innovative in some sense, like showing different types of information. So the, the one down in the corner is, is kind of showing what's left on the table. These are the points that are, are still sort of up for grabs, the services that need some more attention. Um, if you open your data, you get visualizations from others. So here's some quals data that was taken by some, uh, some uh, sort of non-organizer folks and graphed over time. And it's sort of easy in, in different types of visualizations to see um, how the scores progress. So here you can see relatively quickly a lot of teams spike up and one sort of is, is in the lead for a long time, but then there's still a relatively dramatic come from behind a few hours before the competition where the, the red line cuts up. So this, uh, it's, it's qual, so it's a little bit different, but this is an example of that come behind scoring uh, that you'd like to embody in, in the game. Uh, if you want to encourage the availability for a come behind. Teams, there were also teams that were like fairly heavy into like using their lead psychologically during oh, yeah. the game. Like there was a certain team <laughs> that spent the last two hours of, of CTF one year uh, very, very publicly and very sort of flagrantly having all of their people just play Guitar Hero. <laughs> when it, when, when it, Mostly just as like a, you know, you don't even need to try anymore because we've got this. Whenever we say a certain yeah. team, we mean Chris Eagle and Squadron. Yeah, Rupert. pretty much every just, time. Just so yeah. it's clear. <laughs> a certain team is always them. So there's a new, uh, new organizer took over, right? The, the scoreboard is uh, still um, relatively basic. It's displaying the, the same sort of information. This is sort of one of the things that the game ends up being more important for the organizer. So the visualizations end up sort of being backburnered and backburnered and then like cobbled together at the end, right? And... <clears throat> And that code doesn't persist uh, generally from organizer to organizer. So um, you see this, this trend where like a new organizer take over, takes over and then it's like sort of back to square one and it kind of builds back up. So uh, DD Tech's early boards look like that. Um, then you know, later on they had much more um, appealing graphics uh, that uh, displayed some of the same information but also like that's a placeholder screen on the side. And then in the end you, you sort of see the um, the, the, the more appealing side and, and some attempts at uh, trying to display types of information that are kind of hard to consume, like the bubble chart where it shows team uh, versus team action. This one is particular in the number, number of rights per service. So that big blue circle is showing that like one team is like massively overriding on one particular other team instead of evenly distributing their attacks across. Um, and then, you know, like laser gadgets and stuff like that. And then another new team came, come, takes over still relatively basic. They've taken a different approach where it's sort of a graph-based um, thing where the, the edges display types of information, but it's still sort of basic blocks, not uh, particularly appealing. 
that it advances over time, sort of similar information, live. but much more appealing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was saying the, the, the dots going across were live. That was our mm -hmm. first iteration. And I just saw the next one. It's gotten much better. That's all. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I mean, that's, that's sort of the point, right? It yeah. sort of evolves over time, and uh, and and as an organizer, you have an opportunity to decide how you're going to try and convey information and what information you're going to convey, right? Because you want to engage the audience, but uh, in some respect, it actually uh, also informs all of the teams that are sitting there present, right? So in some way, this acts as a, a, an intrusion detection system. You could tell somebody's attacking you, and right. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why you have the stage thing where it's like live, and then it's like delayed, and then it's like gone, and like, well, however you phase it out. Um, but these, these are considerations that you have to have as, a, as an organizer. Um, so then there's the, I'm just gonna rip through these pretty quick so we can get to questions. There's the expansion into physical space. We talked about this a little bit already, right? With the uh, um, going into the, the custom badges that are actually scorable. Um, the the metagame lock picking is super common in lots of CTFs, like as a physical aspect to get to your passwords or your keys or start the game or whatever. Um, another physical uh, thing that was tried as a service that was in the game actually controlled physical things outside the game. Um, so like uh, this was the robotic chicken fight um, that was a, a service in 2011. And uh, that was, a, it was sort of an ancillary to slide. One of the teams actually went out and got like game controllers and, and pro like had an adapter interface to the service where they could actually automatically exploit the service and then control it with their PlayStation 4 controller or something. Um, interesting things, right? Um, so tradition, uh, so future organizers, I, I think there's a lot of aspects of tradition. If you've been a player or close to the organizers, you get some of that, trying to like document some of that here. Um, but there's, there's certainly a desire to keep DEF CON CTF the best in the world. There's certainly a desire to keep it fair and fun and innovative. Um, there's, there's always desire to engage the audience. You never know what the next generation of players is going to be and where they're going to come from. And you really, really want to have that open to everybody. Um, there's logistics, there's game banners and team banners. The winner typically gets to bring the game banner home as part of their spoils. Um, there's swag, there's, there's t-shirts and stickers and so forth. Typically announcements are happening on, on April 1st, right? That's just a, a thing that's happened on you know when falls is going to happen. Um, fortune cookies started. I think, I think uh, Ken Shoto started that because they had a balcony and there was a desire to throw something off the balcony. So there was the, the Sunday tossing of the cookies. That's why we, oh, yeah, we the get coins. Cookies. They're much bigger and they hurt worse. Oh yeah, we had we had the an, like the annual Sunday tossing of the cookies. Right. Yeah. And well, so so some of those are here back in DEFCON 15. Some of these are DD Tech ones. DD Tech incorporated some of the challenges into some of the um, uh, fortunes. So there's stickers, right? It's kind of a, a hacker thing. There's laptop stickers and everybody's got their stickers. There's coins, as uh, HJ mentioned. Uh, it, uh, not necessarily one of the longest lasting traditions, but there's one for, for every year going back a few years. Holy and there's sort shit, of really? Things, <laughs> right? An actual CTF um, tattoo. Uh, stress sheep and, and, and so forth. Teams bring stuff, you can't stop them. They, <laughs> they bring stuff, they do stuff. Um, particularly this like slide sheep. should have been titled, Will There Be Sheep? Um, <laughs> there was a, they modified the stress sheep to have the LED eyes. Um, so teams have to prepare. You've heard a couple of people have already brought up that uh, this is sort of a second job. It's a multi-month. It might be an all-year-round thing. Like, when do you start planning for next year? It's as soon as this year's over kind of thing. Uh, so there's a lot of preparation. There's uh, setting up the servers, the configurations, building the services, building all the infrastructure if you don't already have it. Um, and then if you do like the metagame stuff, you have to set up all the metagame stuff. You have to program the badges. You have to, we did, uh, um, DD Tech interface with all of the human badges. So I think if you have a human badge from DEF CON 18, you actually have CTF code in the firmware. So that's like a whole nother layer of, of, uh, of um, working with, with other parts of DEF CON. Did you guys end up having the thing where like every year you swore off doing it again? Like uh, every yeah. year we were like, we're never yeah. doing this again. Yeah. Yes. And then like a couple months later, you're like, well, maybe. Well, we have some idea. <laughs> you know, if we don't do the thing we did this year, next year, it'll be so much cooler. I mean, there's yeah. still a couple of, like even yeah. now, I like, think, eh, maybe you could do it next year. No, it's written down. We're done. <laughs> yeah. It was like the year that we stopped, the year that we stopped hosting was literally the year that no one stood up and was like, yeah, we're doing this. Like everybody was just like, eh. Yeah, we, we definitely got drunk at Qualls. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do this. We got this. Yep. No, next morning, no, no, no. Not, no. Forget what we just said. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about how much effort there is like year round. 
when you get there on site, there's an amazing amount of things that have to happen behind the scenes. And I say proportionally, most of what you're gonna be looking at as an organizer is something like this. You'll see like the empty rooms with no participants in it. You'll be watching some of your, your buddies terminate network cables across the room as you're trying to make sure all of your services work. Right now. And, um, and right. this, this is the view that you get, or you get a view in the back room near your infrastructure servers or something like that, right? Uh, what the also, I think I think since you're since you're on the topic of preparation, it's also pretty important to point out that the organizers of CTF, the entirety of the infrastructure and the code and the logistics, um, has always been completely something provided by the people actually running CTF. Yeah, like our actual like Ken Shoto's logistics bill every year out of pocket for us was like twenty grand. Yeah, like, that's why I say don't cut our cables. Because like, <laughs> right. there are cables. There are cables. <laughs> Uh, so if we're talking, how much it costs us to ship all the stuff out here. Like yeah, yeah, shipping trade. cost, shipping cost alone, the Pelican cases and all the crazy nonsense. If we're talking proportionally, proportionally, what the teams see are something like this, because again, like the the table limit for fire code are due to prizes. There's only eight black badges. Um, uh, the teams are much larger than that, or some teams are, and you see, uh, you know, extra hotel rooms with wiring all over it, and you see the um, you'll be staring at IDA screens and debugger screens, and, and have your persistent servers that have UPSs strapped to the bottom of them so that you can wheel back and forth as the game goes live. So, so why do people play, right? This, like, these last couple slides sort of like make you wonder, like, why, right? Um, so why do people play? Uh, well, there's challenge. Uh, the, there's some prizes, especially around the world, some of the CTFs are getting like $30,000, $50,000 prizes, right? It's not quite like e-games, but um, like you, you can't make a living at it, but you can make some money. Uh, what if you just couldn't get into talks at DEF CON, right? So you get stuck there, right? I know, right? I th I'm, I'm convinced I was gonna say, I think, I think that last pathological bullet, disorder. glory, glory is the reason you play. Glory, yeah. So the, the real reason, right? And that's right, why we started it's a, it's, Capture the Flag, was to have a yes. chance to go head to head. And you get the black badge. Glory. No, it's a black badge and a jacket. That's why you play. Yep. 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 Oldest, oldest black badge, like. So why, <laughs> so why do organizers organize, right? So this is actually Masochist. the question. Masochism. Uh, yeah, this is the question. This is the first question I want to uh, to hand off to the panel. So before you do that, uh, just very quickly, um, you, you roughly know who's up here, but uh, to um, to introduce them sort of officially, uh, we have Vizzy. Uh, wave your hand. Yeah. So Vizzy. I, I crowdsourced right my bio because so, I'm shit at writing bios. So yeah. this is all the Twitter responses to what should my bio be. Yep. So he crowdsourced the bio. He was an organizer, uh, sort of a, a main or chief organizer for, for Ken Shoto. Uh, Chris Eagle, yeah, down there on the end. Uh, so he was a, um, a player and then an organizer and then a player again. Uh, lots of CTF experience from, from both sides. Um, literally wrote the book on, uh, on Ida Pro. Oh, nice. Dude, hook a brother up. Right now, right? I got you. Don't you worry. Riley? We're, uh, we're rebooting. Sorry. Caesar? One second. Our monitors are not working. They're giving epilepsy out. So Caesar's talking Monetary technical right difficulties. Caesar. So he's, I'm, I'm he's Caesar. A, uh, part of the ghetto hackers yeah. who, who won three times and then became the first formalized organizer and really brought it, brought it to the next level. Uh, also known for, uh, for uh, uh, Caesar's challenge. Um, sort of an annual thing here. 21 you? years. I have thrown a party on Saturday night because uh, being a masochist and doing CTF wasn't enough. <laughs> uh, uh, find me at any time, and I will um, hand you a puzzle. And if you can solve it, which is not very hard this year, uh, if you can so solve it, then I buy you drinks on Saturday. Uh, um, uh, uh Also, <clears throat> excuse me, a two-time champion. Uh, unlike the other champions, we have two different teams. Two right, two different teams. One was God slash Team Awesome, and the second one was Samurai. Yeah, God. Um, and uh, one of the current organizers, so 2013, so we're not really sure when they are going to stop. It's this year, definitely. Yeah, we're not sure when they're going to stop. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Miles, right? Um, Miles is, is uh, responsible. He's like the reason that we're all here, right? Because this wouldn't have happened if he wouldn't have started it. So um, I know that our presentation's not going to do it, but uh, I'm going to interrupt and say yeah. it's time for everyone to give this guy a big round of applause. Capture the flag yeah. is Miles. Is Hacking, hacking is basically a modern watchable sport. I mean, there are Twitch feeds now for this kind of thing, right? And mostly it's all because of the, the bucket that you started kicking. <laughs> 
And, uh, and with that, I'd like to um, kick it back off. And I think the first question will be, so why do organizers organizers and let, organize? And let's go uh, in order, right, in chronological cool. order. And then uh, this room didn't get set up uh, well. We don't have mics. So if you have a question you want to ask, uh, you have to come up here and you can either take the mic or, or I can repeat it. And then also I'll put up a, um, I'll try this thing where you can put up a URL and you can um, like send questions to the podium. Uh, yeah, I, we'll see how that works. I would not trust a single person in this room for that. Yeah. Yeah, it goes through Google stuff. <laughs> so Miles, uh, so Miles. Why CTF? Yeah, yeah. Why, why organize? Because there wasn't a way to figure out who was best and not practice out on the live internet where the con would get shut down. <laughs> and that, you, we forget that. It was, like it was, when so you're saying it was harm reduction? Harm reduction. <laughs> for the public. Totally. And you forget that, like, at first, I went by a NIM because I was seriously worried if my employers heard about capture the flag, I might be fired. And I worked as a security guy. And this last year I was in the Smithsonian, there's a black badge there. I mean, this is really different. So yeah, it was harm reduction, it was head to head. It was a chance also if you had controlled the environment that you could start throwing in some stuff that explains it to the general public about why would someone stand in front of the screen for so long? Well, because it's really cool and there's these things and it's a puzzle that they're solving. So it was clear to me that we needed something with a bit more showmanship and also a chance where attackers and defenders could go head to head and that it didn't break the rest of the network and throw out the con. <laughs> yeah, uh, for, for us, we came and um, we felt like we knew enough about security to not necessarily need to see every single talk. So we'd catch a, <laughs> a couple of talks and enjoy it, and then we'd kind of wander over and see Miles' game and say, you know, gee, so I just sat down at a table Every person who was at that table today is a dear friend of mine today, and like we go out together all the time. We live near each other. We've all moved to, to uh, live near each other. So my social life is Miles's fault. Uh, the Ghetto Hackers were formed because we didn't have any paper, because we didn't bring pens or paper or notebooks or, or hardly anything. Uh, so we had a napkin and uh, mascara, and uh, we wrote IP addresses that were available on the network. That was our, our group of friends came out of us uh, sitting around each other. And for us, uh, after the first year, the first year we just kind of tried and saw how it was. And, and then after that, there was kind of this fire of, well, you know, if we just stored every exploit we know, <laughs> and that, that, was, that was the contest back then, was like, how many exploits can you bring in a searchable, usable format? And, uh, and it, it, be, it just became this, this passion to actually just get better. So for, for us, we didn't necessarily try to win as much as we tried to be, be, get good, like get good scrub. That, we were scrubs and, and we came and you kind of made a crucible and a bunch of hackers popped out. And then why did you run it? <laughs> why did we run it? Uh, we ran the contest uh, after the third year. Uh, somebody in one of the teams said that they hated us and we were cheating bastards and that they didn't want to play against Hackers, us. hello. We, we, we took it as a great honor and pride. And, but, but there was something, uh, a spark in, 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 in our, among us that um, made us jump up and volunteer to take the game to a new level. And so uh, we got up on stage and, and talked about coming back the next year and making a new contest. And Miles was part of that contest as well. Uh, and, and that was how we kind of came to the... Um, scoreboard and, and, and sort of all the, some of the trappings that are the beginnings of what these guys who won the contests that we threw and we handed the reins to them. That's actually kind of been a tradition. I know it was kind of touched on early, but there's also a, you, you end up feeling this sort of sense of, of belonging and ownership to the game um, when, you're all, when you win it also. Um, and you have your own designs on how you want it to be or how you think it should be. So, like, transitioning to the reason that, like, Ken Shoto uh, decided to run CTF for a few years, I think there's, I mean, there's a number of facets. But for us, watching, watching the ghetto hackers and watching the coalescence that it caused in the hacker community specifically, and the, and the crucible effect actually is super huge. Like, I, we would watch people literally have a reason, have drive to learn all these new exploit mechanisms and, and all of these, like, details about pulling packets apart and whatever. So for us, actually, 
I think that the biggest thing that, that caused us to actually run CTF was uh, we were concerned initially uh, that it would be taken over instead of by someone that is about the hacker community, that it would be taken over by a university or a corporation or whatever like that. And we were very concerned about that initially. <laughs> Turns out, you know, off we go, modern times and all that. But um, but the other reason, um, the other reason that Ken Shoto stayed in the game, the reason that not not the first year, but the reason for the years after that, um, was we really felt that it was sort of an unmeasured, uh, like an unmeasured resource, right? So as an example, um, in our game, we were sort of one of the first people to be like, don't bring any of those exploits because they're not going to work because it's all going to be entirely custom software with challenges that you have to reverse engineer and exploit and land payloads against, like in that weekend. And for us, that was um, it was really important for us because we felt that that was a that was something where people hadn't stretched far enough yet. the The bar wasn't high enough, and we felt like um, we felt like we wanted to continue to be able to push that higher and higher, so that eventually not everyone was making it. So, as an example, actually, there's also what what do they call it? I think they renamed Amateur CTF, but it's called something else open now. CTF. There's several now. Open CTF, yeah, right? Open. Of course, Project Two. So. But like that subtle, as an example, subtle, humble brag uh, there. No, yeah, right. But so that essentially formed out of the fact that we pushed, we tried to push the game into actually measuring the real red line of what people were capable of in a weekend, and that that really drove us for the years after the first year that we hosted. The first year it was because we were super concerned that it was going to become this like corporate sponsorship kind of thing, um, and after that it was because we thought that the the, the performance that we had seen uh, warranted further measurement higher and higher. So. And yeah. that is a perfect transition to hand to <laughs> Mr. Right? Spillery. Because we, we had a lot of the same reasons. So we had played in Miles' game. We played in Caesar's game. We played in Busy's game. And uh, we loved every iteration. Um, I teach, and it turned out that the game, as it evolved, was a, was a great microcosm of the security space uh, in which to uh, conduct uh, teaching and learning. Uh, my students got really excited about it, so uh, we loved the game as it was. I loved uh, the, the game uh, the last year we played uh, with Ken Shoto. And when they stepped down, we were also very worried that you know some company would come in and commercialize this thing. Uh, and we looked around and we'd say, well, who's going to run it? We, could, we couldn't imagine who might run it. That's I, exactly I, I think there was one other team that might have run it. We didn't know what they would pitch. Uh, so we made our pitch. I think another team made their pitch. Um, and uh, we Our basically, <laughs> <laughs> but you lost. Our, um, our, our, our pitch, our pitch was a li was basically, if you don't give it to us, it's going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> Ours was if you give it to them, it'll suck. <laughs> um, uh, and we really liked the game and wanted to see it continue in much the same vein. Of course, it didn't occur to us that we then wouldn't get to play for four years. Um, and then Playing is way more fun than Why running. we kept running it was more or less, well, we screwed that one up. Maybe it'll be better next year. Um, I think we might have got it. We got it close to your, right the fourth time. Your last year was good. Yeah, we got it close to right the fourth. It actually started on time. It did? Uh, you didn't delete all of our scores. Yeah. So, um, Chris, Chris before you, before you before you stop, Chris, uh, how did it change your team's experience, your school's experience, to go from playing to running it to playing? What do, do you play differently because you ran because you ran it? No, uh, playing to running is a really tough thing. So uh, it's a, it's an entirely different mindset to become an organizer. Right, so yeah, if, if you're if you're doing you know Voldev type stuff, and then now you've got to turn around and write it, you got to write with an entirely different mindset. Uh, writing a challenge is no easy task. It's easy to put one bug uh, in the challenge of a very specific nature. It's a little more difficult not to put other bugs in that you it's didn't really, mean to. Yeah. It's really hard to write secure insecure code. Yeah. <laughs> just that's just right. exploitable right. enough. Yeah. And, uh, and, and how many so, of you have found exploits in code you were adapting? Because I know I was finding exploits out there. It's like, wow, that's been vulnerable since '90. And we actually had one. two challenges that that literally just incorporated a library that we knew had an O-Day in it. Yeah, and we wrote challenges like that too. You take things from real world and you try to bake it into this challenge. We didn't want to drop mountains of software. Like, okay, here's Apache. Find the O-Day, um, <laughs> which was easier, you know, ten years ago. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, everything was pretty stripped down, and you, you try to build the bug you want people to hit, and you try not to have other bugs. Um, so from from running to organizing, that, that mindset was hard for some people to to uh, adapt to. So we did lose a lot of people actually from the from the playing side. They, that's what they want to do, and they want to keep on playing. I don't blame them. 
Um, but yeah, we were a much smaller group when we uh, during the time we spent running it. That tells into another yeah. question. This thing's actually working, so we're getting questions that are coming in. Uh, so uh, you want to answer HJ, and oh, sure. then I'll follow I think, into I the next uh, question. I think a short and sweet was anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> um, we played um, text game that's, that's uh, and got two black badges out of it. Sorry, we played their game, got two black badges, and saw what they did and knew how we were assholes and how to beat ourselves and decided we could make an interesting game. Masochism. What's that? I was just going to say, no boils down to masochism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we, know how, yeah we, we make people upset about how we beat their defenses. But anyway, um, so yeah, same, actually same reason. Like we played their game and thought we could do better or do things differently and take it in an interesting, interesting direction for the community. So. And they've done an amazing job. And I will say that one thing as an organizer, the only thing I'll add is the only fun you can have in organizers is trying to fuck with the players. Okay. Totally true. Absolutely 100% so true. So whether it's a challenge you designed or some new twist, the badge I, challenge, the new customer I really still get a kick out of it. Challenges, or challenges that were actually purposely not actually exploitable. Yeah. There was a bug, but it like couldn't be landed. No, we, yeah, that's ours, ours are always. <laughs> you thought there was a bug, and now you want Except to say you fuck with the players. <laughs> What's that? Yours are always exploitable yeah, unless your index is zero. <laughs> oh, that was an accident. For one yeah. team. Yeah. For one team. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, it was exploitable. So the follow-on question, which uh, perhaps I'll ask uh, Chris first since you already kind of started answering it, um, how big are the organizing teams? And you can sort of take that with, with the transition from player to organizer and everybody else can answer it. Obviously. Well, we went from about 900 players <laughs> down to... <laughs> uh, you probably a core that topped out around 10 Mm. But, you know, uh, there was, you know, even a subset of that that was a little more active But uh, for the four years we ran it. We're around 10 as well. Um, yeah, we, Kinshota was around 8. We had a couple it, of outside contributors. Yeah, but composes between, like, people who write challenges, people who organize. Like, Gaina, who's actually the head, he's, um, he's more of, like, having to deal with uh, DEF CON stuff. Um, we've got one guy who's just an amazing network guy. No joke, he is a person that Cisco calls when they can't answer a problem. Not even, ju not even joking. Yeah, we were um, as many as 14, but we did, you know, we made movies, we did all sorts of stuff. But it was really only, I think, um, six or eight people that were the core of our team. You were one. Yeah. Okay. Miles was the <laughs> and Miles, one. army of one. <laughs> and at, the, at the end, was it still one, or you had grown into a couple of people at the last couple? It was one, yeah. and that's why it was time to hand it yeah, on. Yeah, you lasted, you lasted longer. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. Um, so it turns out that this thing allows you to vote. So there's actually like most popular questions. Um, what is the most unexpected way someone solved the challenge? So there's like an intended path, and then there's like <laughs> unintended paths. So yeah, there's a lot of them. Well, I mean, so they used a free thing. BSG yeah. jailbreak to, <laughs> <laughs> to get out of our jails. Yeah. But uh, we we watched them do it, and they were so inept when they got out. Yeah, people people <laughs> bringing O days, people bringing O days, and then completely messing up using them correctly would be a. It's a good one. The, my favorite one was I had managed to, let's see, Quake was the hot game in <laughs> DEF CON 4 or 5. So I managed to talk in software to donating Quake licenses to the Capture the Flag contest. So I had Quake servers and a couple of stations set up so that people could play Quake, and then I got free video games out of it. So all good. Um, and so someone came up to me and said, you know, we have denial of servers, but it's not on the network. We can attack the Quake server, and one of the people gets so pissed off, he goes over and reboots the machine, and that causes it to reboot so we can run our RC script. I said, go for it. <laughs> we, uh, we convinced a team to surrender <laughs> and give us all their points by telling them that we were about to win, even though they were ahead. And so they joined and all became ghetto hackers. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna relay something we were talking about earlier, an anecdote we were talking about specifically in the ghetto hackers playing. So it wouldn't be an instance of Caesar having seen this occur as a novel way to score points or win the game, um, but having executed a novel way to win the game. Uh, they basically convinced the CTF organizers at the time that they needed to they needed to store a half rack of equipment that they had. So they had you know your little like. Uh, what would it be, 20-ish 20, 20 U rack. Um, and they had uh, completely built out entire faceplates of real servers and stuff, and they like stuffed a person into the half rack <laughs> and actually got them to store it in the room with all the rest of the CTF equipment and infrastructure overnight, because they're like, well, we need a place to put this, right? And so, obviously, out creeps person. Single roots all the machines. Single roots all the boxes. Reboots them all. Peace. <laughs> puts them in single user mode. Roots them all. 
we come back in the morning, having not prepared or worked or done anything the night before. <laughs> like, we went, come in, we were like, I were pretty even drinking all night. Uh, <laughs> the contest is over, so let's all just go home. And we got a whole bunch of points, and it was, yeah, it was pretty good. This contest was not over. Well, no, we I, did I, not I already home. mentioned the, uh, the Bash RC one, which is fantastic. When we were playing, we once snuck the, the root search for one of the teams and got first blood on every service. That was during your, your game. Mm. Uh, this works pretty good. I can just like go to the wow. next most popular one. Um, so how do you come up with unique uh, flags or challenges? I think, uh, I think that means challenges or services uh, every year, aside from following CVEs or repeating content. from. That was actually a serious source of exhaustion. It is. Like, actually, like mental exhaustion yeah. of attempting to come up with services. And we used to end up even, like we would literally scrap two or three services every year because they wouldn't get deployed correctly or they wouldn't <laughs> be done. But like coming up with unique ideas of like, oh, here's a web service that helps you make a sandwich like or whatever. Well, and, and now with... 20 years of DEF CON history. Exactly. Yeah. History. Now you want to like, do not, something original and, and like... And that's just DEF CON history. That's not talking about every other CTF. All the other CTFs, yeah, for 100 sure. 100 plus probably per year. And how do you actually be unique? You can't really be unique anymore. No, definitely not. That's why... We would, actually, we would actually basically... The real truth of the story, how we produced our services, was mostly about getting a bunch of people in a room, getting a bunch of whiskey in the room too, and like just bullshitting until funny ideas came out, and then like codifying that list into services. And then, and then going and deciding what kind of exploit goes into it, what kind of whatever. But every one of those services had a little... Oh, for us, yeah. what we've done is we've really introduced multiple architecture, architectures. Like, uh, three years ago, I think we had five different architectures in one game. I mean, it was just x86 and, and you know, MIPS. There was, we even had Windows IoT ARM challenges running a power PC shell or something. Like that. I don't know. And this year, of course, like I mentioned, we have the, the custom architecture that we built. But it really is. We've had to push it. Nobody's getting... quite explained this. Custom architecture means oh, right. a system for storing bits in electronics. <laughs> right. So imagine an like instruction like set. They implemented a CPU instruction. Yeah, we implemented a, a CPU. processor, a VM, all up on top of nothing. Right. It's it's um, whole cloth. And by it's we, fantastic. I mean, Lightning actually did it, but <laughs> single handedly. Um, Epic. Yeah, it's just pretty good. Um, yeah, that's pretty much. It. We've had, and the caliber of people who are playing. Are just phenomenal. Like they frighten me now. People like Loki and, and Geo Hodge, scary good. Yep. So the, the challenges, the level that we have to do for uh, the difficulty has astronomically increased. Um, like the, the medium challenges back in the day are now easy challenges for everybody. Right. Yeah, tools <clears throat> tools have gotten so much better too. You don't want to write a, a, a challenge that's going to be auto solved by a tool under you know under a minute. So yeah, like things like anger and stuff CGC like that. Stuff. that can, yeah. Auto -solve yeah, you have is just yeah. yeah you have to keep up with the state of the tools mm -hmm. and uh, try to find the weaknesses in the tools yeah. so that uh, you still get the human who's got to do the deep dive. Weaknesses in the that's tools. a good segue into the next actually set of questions. There's uh, several related to uh, CGC and, and sort of automation. Um, lessons learned from from Cyber Grand Challenge. It's been a year. Was it a success? Hackers are or obsolete. Was it a success <laughs> or a failure? I'm looking for one. I sorted these and now I can't find one that I saw earlier. There's this one. Mostly for Vizzy. How many years until a computer wins DEF CON CTF? Right? Uh, that's so the, the, thing that the, the thing that the computers have trouble with, right, is the dirty tricks department. Um, and so I think it'll be a while, unless a game is designed specifically for the computer system. I mean, that's really that's really kind of where we're at. Like right now, I think CGC was a really good example of this just massive leap forward in technology. But at the same time, you have to keep in mind um, that it was a reduced instruction set and a reduced syscall set and all these other things that add a really sufficient level of complexity that I think there's still a lot of room, a lot of wiggle room for like the human dirty tricks department <clears throat> kind of mindset. So I think it'll be a little while yet. But it depends kind of on the structure of the game. So if elements of the game require creative, th creative thought and unique approaches, um, I think that'll continue to kind of be an arms race. Yeah, I only think it matters if they have arms. If you have to actually go <laughs> lockpick something, that the computer right, won't exactly. do that well. Oh, and actually, that's a really good example because, because you guys were notorious specifically for incorporating into CTF a whole bunch of side games where those side games were like, every team gets issued this ancient hard drive that was like gigantic, and they're going, that hard drive is painted your team's color, and it's going to be out at the DEF CON shoot, which I think still happens, right? Miles. Yeah. 
Yeah, that the incorporating the DEFCON shoot was mine. Right. That turned out to be a really bad idea. <laughs> right. Well, and so basically, I think a team got a, a team got some bonus points for like having like basically punched a hole with a bullet like through the most center point of the drive or something like that. Um, computers aren't going to do that for a little while yet. So the, the other aspect with computers is uh, you have to freeze the game. Right. Chess is doesn't change. Chess is chess. It's been chess forever, and a computer knows how to play chess. And yeah. It, how, if you how would, want to. How would the computer? How would the computer deal with this new yeah. architecture? Yeah. Right. So you know, we, we want to see something different every year. We want to throw curveballs every year, and it's unless you advertise that some amount of time in advance, like the CGC version that you guys did last year. Uh, it's. I think in DefCon CTF in particular, I don't think we'll ever see it because that's not the game we humans want to play. All, all we'll ever need is 64k of RAM, right? <laughs> <clears throat> So uh, it, it what probably wasn't clear earlier, but four people up here were involved in, in the CGC competition in some way. And then for those that aren't aware, DEF CON CTF last year was mostly more or less CGC compatible, right? And the winner of CGC, the, the machine, was a player in the CTF competition last year, which kind of ties all these questions back into the panel. So uh, it's sort of a related question that um, I won't direct at anybody in particular, but so it's been a year, right? CGC was last year and the CTF that had the computer was um, was a year ago. Um, was that a, a success, a failure? Was it sort of a, 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 I would a say, yeah. in history? I would say it was definitely a success. <clears throat> I really am a fan of the fact that uh, Anger was really open source. Um, I think so getting, these, tools. Right, getting, getting these tools out to the, <clears throat> the general community is fantastic. The fact that, that anybody can go and use these and learn how to write software, or write tools to automatically RE and go towards uh, exploitation is fantastic. Um, when you can lower the bar uh, to entry, it really makes it that much better. Learning, uh, learning how the teams did their job last year mm -hmm. is probably the best thing that anyone in the audience, mm -hmm. any of us, could imagine doing for their career for the next year. And, and to be honest, it even state of the art, uh, the future of RE just in normal careers is going to be automated. It's, it's software is becoming so incredibly difficult. Some amount of automation is going to be required just to get even the low hanging fruit anymore. So in court, we're actually, we have to incorporate this idea into CTF so that we can still be representative of the wider security community. Yeah, I think that's the mistake people make when they look at CGC is to think that the goal was to build a purely autonomous system, and that wasn't the goal. The goal was to advance the state of the art in software uh, analysis. And what we're, you know, we'll see it, we saw it last year, we'll see it this year, is that uh, software automatons assisting humans, make, you know, making humans better at what they're doing is, is probably where we're going. The best chess playing systems in this world are hybrid systems that pair computers with chess players, you know, not, not purely computers. Yeah, I think I think we've seen that too in like uh, uh, even other CTFs now with modern things like anger being applied in an automated way to catch some of the low hanging fruit or point out areas of the code that's like this probably like we don't it can't necessarily automatically generate an exploit for every condition yet. So we've actually had challenges that required um, anger or some automation yep. automated reverse engineering. That Absolutely. Was, like I think it was called a thousand cuts by Vito, yep. where you, did, you were given a thousand binaries really fast and you had to be able to exploit them and computer speed, not human speed. Yep. Um, there's even a challenge on Ponable.kr called AEG, where it requires you, you download it, and it gives you a random binary every time, and you have to uh, auto-RE it and uh, write the exploit. So how international has CTF become? Um, when did international teams start showing up, and do Americans still stand a chance? One of the, one of the first uh, things that I remember happening was uh, Dylan Canaberon from Hack in the Box. Uh, reached out and asked uh, if he could take CTF, obviously do it yourself, I mean, do whatever you want, but uh, that was uh, taking CTF to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia uh, in, I think, 2001. So it's it's been coming for a long time. It's been diversifying and spreading rapidly. Uh, it's, I think, one of the most true and honest ways that hackers can really be better than each other because we're not very good, I think, otherwise, at knowing, like, am I good enough? And being able to say, well, I'm better than that guy is a huge, huge uh, foundation to stand on. Yeah, we have uh, competitors from all over. Like, we've got Korean and Taiwan, Taiwanese and Chinese, and m most major areas of, of the world are representative. Yep. Like, are represented. Re and um, actually, two years ago, DEFCOR from, I believe, Korea actually won our game. So 
it was a, one of the first times that I can remember, the Nopsled one, they were, and they were mostly Danish, um, that they've won CTF. I remember actually, it kind of, it kind of like goes back to some of the slides you were talking about earlier with the language barrier stuff. I think the first like fully like non-English speaking team um, was was field was a couple of the Korean teams that were fielded early on in the Kenshoto CTF, and like we actually had to really specifically sit down and think like what are we going to do about this because we don't want to create a game like the game isn't about English the game is about bits right and so like we actually tried to create like pic like we actually went through several iterations of attempting to create like pictographic representations of like stealing a key key submission and things like that with like little like you know mm -hmm. stick figures and stuff like that because the language barrier was so significant that um, I remember actually one of the um, the captain of the Korean team at the time um, they did amazingly well in quals they like whomped everyone in quals that year they show up uh, at the actual game and they had a lot of trouble but it was mostly about understanding what was going on and the and the actual mechanisms of the game and the, the captain of that team came up to me and was like I think this next year we're gonna work on hacking English <laughs> nice. uh, some of those stickers I think that might have become stickers later on yeah no they were uh, totally so stickers at the top there you can see them oh yeah actually no that's that's exactly some of what I'm talking about we were yeah. like yeah. So I mean, clearly you didn't make those like right then, but like that became a thing for later. Yeah. Um, so I guess speaking of that, uh, what's with all the the Japanese or like sort of Asian references, right? So like when Miles ran it, it had like the big. It's uh, his fault. The, the red. Uh, Did you have a pagoda, Miles? The, the Japanese thing. Right? No, I think that was actually. Was that cut out? Oh, okay. We did. Uh, we decided that we wanted to give away a championship belt. So we gave away the Root Fu Championship. It was like a boxing belt, like like a literal like WWF like belt. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we made up this whole concept of Root Fu, and it was going to be um, you know a measure of how good you could compete against other people. And it basically turned into hacking, and 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 the the whole thing fell down. But as a theme, you know, we had. Um, uh, all the cultural references in, in, in Blade Runner and Hackers and I mean the connection to cyberpunk. yeah cyberpunk uh, you know, Chatsubo uh, I think it was just kind of the gestalt hacker meme at the time um, as were a whole lot of bad ideas and things that were growing past so <laughs> we don't have to live in that world forever but uh, I think it was just the way things uh, everything grew up then we kind of just followed suit. I mean, Kenshoto actually, the like the name is in Japanese, right? So for us, there was that tie-in, but it was mostly out of the influence of that same sort of cyberpunk picture that you guys had created. And and one of our uh, founding members, uh, Brazen Angel, uh, is a Korean uh, woman who uh, fits in a half rack. It turns out, uh, <laughs> and she and uh, Data Angel uh, did all of the what we called the Ghetto News Network. We did. Um, news videos that were kind of in um, the Blade Runner. If you remember the movie Blade Runner up on the screens, there's uh, some kind of Asian commercials, I think, over like a soda. Absolutely, uh, we yeah. kind of took that image and we just blew it out and made a whole fake news system. They had her basically congratulating teams on not fucking up the network, as I recall correctly. Uh, yeah, so I just have some backup slides that show some of that. There's the I can't remember what that's called, but it's like the Japanese thing for a um, uh, something religious, the red thing in the background there. <clears throat> and uh, like certainly the Japanese stuff continues over time. Um, so what's the, oh, I wanted to, this one. So how do you find middle ground uh, in the challenges between the ones that are too easy and the ones that are too hard? Everything is too easy. <laughs> yep. Hackers are so much better when they're under so, pressure than we are when we're sitting around trying to be actually, cool. The way our, we had to modify our scoring algorithm we, the way we do it is uh, so for quals, everything starts out at five points except for babies first. And the more people solve it, the less it becomes worth. So it just kind of, they were self-correcting. Because yep. um, we, we're, it's funny, if you write a challenge, it's really hard to judge how hard it is when you write it yourself. So, so wait, it's five points when I get it, but then uh, so many people follow along that I lose my points? Right. Yes. So it's, yeah, it's, that's fantastic. Yeah. We also that's made, so much smarter. We made other people in Kenshoto um, actually do all the challenges with no prior knowledge of them. And testing. So, yeah, testing, essentially. Time is the problem. Because that. the problem it's is it's also really, it's really easy to implement a challenge where there's some like leap of faith that you didn't realize you've made. 
and that other people wouldn't and aren't part of like a logical analysis progression. And so that being the case, like we we had found challenges. Actually, there were one or two in your guys' game too, and there have been others in specifically and usually in Qual's rounds where like there's some like leap of faith required. If you actually I think the I think the I best examples ranks. are listen listen to the crazy ass explanations of the DEF CON badge challenges where they're like, I realized that these dots were actually Morris code of geolocation things that were airports that then if you arrange the airports and then reverse their letters and just all these things that you're like, why did you think to do that in the first place? And so like we didn't we didn't want to have challenges that were that were why did you think to do that in the first place? We wanted there to be this sort of like thread through them. And and essentially the way that we would enforce that was just entirely here you go, other person on Kenshoto, like go break this and solve it. It's also really easy to make questions that are easy for your top 1%. And so it's like no one gets it and the top 1% gets it in five minutes and then where's the rest of the content? Well, but that's, so for the, for the real game, that's what we were shooting for because we were trying to, we were basically, if anyone was topping out that bar and solving all the challenges, they weren't hard enough, right? So for us, we, we considered it a failure in any year if someone solved all the challenges. And so I think that the, like the pushing of that scale to, to being higher, we didn't really concern ourselves in the real game with that approachability or, or middle ground, but in quals we did, because that's the thing that like, everybody gets to play, everybody gets to be inspired and do something. Right? One of the things that we did for quals was that we really, prior to us, they had things like forensics and trivia. And because those weren't really necessary for the actual <laughs> finals game, um, we only did like, you know, ponables, we did like guerrilla programming, things that will you have to know in order to play the, uh, succeed in finals. So forensics where you have to go and take you know, the first bit of every <laughs> sector off the NTFS dry or section, oh, that was terrible. That was also before you did flag, open brace, close brace. That's when you were guessing. Yeah, we left those in because we want to be, we want quals to be accessible to a large number of people. Yeah, it was a conscious decision um, for us. So that's, 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 that's why we added babies first, yeah. because we wanted that same approachability without but still be you know, directly, uh, or, uh, be directly applicable to the game. Play school, my first deep exploit. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> have you guys ever seen evidence of collusion? <laughs> so we uh, literally I was colluded with teams. Teams all won the time. via collusion. <laughs> We only won by collusion. <laughs> uh, uh, where's where's Zion? Is he here so, somewhere? There he is. <laughs> so I think at, at this stage in the game, for us, most people have at least begun treating it by like a gentleman's game. Like, we genuinely want to see who is the best. And other teams feel the same way. Yeah. Like, for example, uh, a few years ago, there was a team, for some reason, who put a wiki up on the game network. And that wiki had their passwords on it. And one of the, the teams, actually the Yonops letters came up and said, hey guys, we saw that these guys had a wiki up, you should probably tell them. And that was during finals, where they could have gone and just completely just wiped all their flags yep. and just ran the board. But it's really become, like I said, a gentleman's game. So yeah. for the most part, like, I don't it think... It was like in our game, like we were owning other people's laptops and stuff too. Yeah. Like if it was connected to the network... Sure. So that's sort of breaking so, outside of the intended path, but that's not really collusion, right? That's no, there was, but there was legitimate team. There was legitimate team collusion, yeah. at least in the in the in one of the ghetto hacker wins, and and uh, I mentioned Zeon and Didrev and stuff like that from back in the day, because it's that's actually a really hard thing from a game mechanic to detect, mm -hmm. and so we actually had. So I mentioned the idea of like, haha, to like mess with the teams. We had services that weren't exploitable, but they were actually canary services because if someone submitted a token from that from another team either the game mechanism was broken and they managed to get tokens they shouldn't be able to or they're colluding. Mm -hmm. So we were very concerned about that because it's almost impossible to totally prevent, right? If you're just like slide a couple of tokens by here and there between two teams so that they can like get get way far out ahead, you make it so that it's a race between two rather than eight or ten, right? Uh, yeah, for us, the, the biggest problem with collusion happens in quals. So, you, yeah. you have less control over quals than what's going on in the game itself because it's not on your own infrastructure. They're not in a room. I actually think uh, the our game mechanic that we do where if you submit more than, like, submit the keys, uh, that, that score drops for everybody. Um, you'll see, so back whenever I ac actively played, I had a, a team myself. I would go and test the keys to see if it worked. And, however, that's actually a bad move now. Because if you were to do that, you actually drop the score for everybody, including your own team. Yeah. So if you start colluding, there's a possibility that somebody will actually tr pull ahead of both of you. So right. 
That just, yeah, because you end up cutting those. strategy, right? Because now the people that are you can dilute flags that are more important to other teams. Yeah, right. But, but if Jay, is that specific to quals? That's specific to quals. Yeah. But if you're on top, then you're on top, right? Right. So that's, right. that's not going to affect too much. Yeah. I mean, we, we built collusion detection into quals because we had unique chances. Challenges were tweaked in a in a small way, or everybody had their you know their own service, or their like own accounts, monitoring or, source IP addresses yeah. of submissions, and yeah, people would say, "I can't log into my account." That's because you're using somebody else's creds, and you're not supposed to see those creds unless you've been sharing. You know, the keys were different per team, so we we did set up some services that were specifically to detect teams that were sharing answers. It takes a massive amount of work. I, th I think the the conclusion is that uh, as an organizer, you're increasingly playing game theory. We're playing a game. Everybody else is doing an activity. But we make an activity, and for us, it's a game. And maybe that's why we like to So that's to why you organize, because you want to play the game. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Well, we know the tricks for the game, so we try to beat them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, so here's a perhaps interesting question. So why is uh, the finals uh, attack defense style? Why don't you just continue Jeopardy style? Oh, because that's not hacking. Yeah, right. because, yes, because hacking. reality. Yep. Because that's... <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> right. If, if no. we wanted, if we wanted to be a puzzle game, it would be a puzzle game. We want it yeah. to be a hacking game. It, we, There's almost zero pressure in Jeopardy. Right. right. You sit exactly. back and you answer questions, and you're in your living room. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Attack defense. You, you, there's head a reactive head. nature to that, yep. and that that can <clears throat> cause people to, to well, shut and, down. And we've always wanted to make a contest that everyone could start. Everyone could start down the road yep. to winning Defcon's ETF, and we needed something that's hard enough that it actually slows people down who aren't ready. So it adds another game mechanic in terms of, uh, like, so for example, defense, like patching. I can patch my binary, but there's a chance that it will now fail polls. So And the whole SLA discussion right. from and earlier. We've also added uh, a game mechanic in our game where we have a concurrency for patches. So if you patch something and all you do is add, you know, 40, hex 40 to the size of the stack, well, that's published now, so everybody can see what you just patched. If you take nothing else away from this conversation, that is the piece of sheer genius that we've been missing this whole time since we started playing, Agreed. is when you add defense, everyone else has an opportunity to do the same. That turns it, yep. I think, really into a game, finally, mm -hmm. for the players, because now, do I accept your patches blind? Oh, PPP. Like, they've definitely backdoored patches. Like, they'll, they'll patch something, and then, yep. like, yeah, go ahead, use our patch. See what happens. Yeah, and like purposely deploying patches that then cause other people to try and analyze those to figure out what was going on. Purposely deploying a harmless patch that doesn't actually necessarily fix anything, but sufficiently complicates something or that, you use, that you use resources of the other team having to try and reverse engineer. Like, what the hell does that patch mean? I've you definitely heard of uh, patches with QMU bugs in them. Yup. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can create an obfuscated code contest subcontest as a player <laughs> now while you use this system. Which, which really ultimately becomes like a team captain leadership triage contest, yeah. really. Who, because who, who came up with this idea? So it was actually uh, the guys who did CGC. It yeah. was their idea. Yeah, it, it came from CGC. Just, 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 just the fantastic. most important thing that's yeah. happened. Um, how about <clears throat> what's the... Uh, I uh, can't find the exact wording. What's the, the hardest question or service that each of you have ever fielded in your tenure? Man, that's hard. super tough. Yeah, yeah it's, and it's like, like no preparation. You just have to come up with it. But like, which one do you? Remember? I would say every new CTF is so much harder than the old ones <laughs> that listening to anybody but Hawaii Joe is probably a waste of time because yeah. the new contests are just so much harder. Well, so uh, I'll give I, I invented a CPU in order to write bugs on. Um, so uh, is such a high bar. One of our guys, uh, Salir, sorry, not Salir, it was uh, J Dub. Um, he wrote a mud, like a full featured mud where you had to go in and collect certain uh, numbers of items <laughs> from each, like from uh, NPCs. And then that's your shell code. So the, in the place, then, then you actually cause, you trigger the overflow and the number of items you have of different types becomes your, um, your code, yeah, your shell code, right. So we had, a mud, we had a mud, but you could hit A a lot of times. <laughs> And then hit enter, and it would crash. Yeah, no. <laughs> See, like, the game is full, not the same like, thing. <laughs> what was really fun is he put uh, he made us all god mode characters, <laughs> um, so we got to walk around in it, and it was really funny because if somebody attacks you, you can't stop attacking back. It just happens automatically. Right. So eventually, I realized, all right, we don't hit these guys because <laughs> if you hit them, I just die. 
We we had a we had a, a mud a couple of years, but it was all just about like uh, the social aspects of quals. It was where everybody would would talk and and hang out and stuff during quals. Um, but effectively, we ended up like killing all the players a couple of times by accident. Yeah. And, like some monster that one of the other Kenshoto people was creating like got loose, and we didn't. I don't know. Oh, it was Sir, it was Sir, so Sir the guy who wrote the mud, is also the guy who. Uh, developed the badge that you saw up there. So that badge, he designed, and we floated ourselves on a hot plate. Like not even joke, we put it on there. You know, did all the, the solder and LED, the the components and floated on a hot plate. And that was you had to exploit it over RF. You can send them all text messages back and forth. <laughs> yeah. So a slight a slight twist question that came in from the audience. Uh, what about the most elaborate challenge that you were able to dream up but that I couldn't quite pull off? It was like still on the uh, list. Let me make sure I can act. A really good scoreboard. I can actually talk. Uh, ours, uh, 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 the, the ours, was the, uh, ours was the uh, World Series of Pocus Poker Printer Challenge. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember that one. Oh, yeah. That's that, right. That's that's we, we started to that. destroy that thing. You're like, no, no, no. It's not our printer. We, <laughs> yeah, we started to remember that one. One year at the Rio, we, we rolled in right after the World Series of Poker had ended. And in the back rooms were all the printers that they had used for the World Series of Pokers. And we just wheeled one out and put one on every table. Everyone had an Ethernet jack. <laughs> we, we ran cable to every table. And uh, yeah, we wanted to work that into the game, but didn't quite get there. <laughs> so. well, yeah, some of them got fully disassembbled and never reassembled. And, yeah, I think, there's there's I think actually Defcon, some significant analysis actually, on the internet. Yeah, Defcon ended printers, up having to yeah. pay for a few printers, I think. Uh, Gino, are you here? <laughs> No. I was trying to ask if I can mention his challenge, but I guess I'll go ahead. I sent him a text message. So he came up with an awesome idea, uh, GDB over phone. So we dial in and it says, this is your prompts. And he actually got a decent way into the challenge. Like, I you know, press one for R. All right, these, these are your registers. All right, you know, step. That was, uh, we, but we couldn't, the, 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 band, the bandwidth of throughput just wasn't enough for that one. Operator, operator. Oh, my God, that's great. That's great. Real person. Right. Well, uh, then, and I, then, like, do the teams have to implement like like audio like, like language processing, processing in order to automate the that, on that hang, hang, hang on, hang on. Like, yeah, at Goa at Nullcon, uh, I was I was really proud of one of the kids there. <clears throat> he made a DTMF only attack for IVRs. He found a SQL injection attack in the <laughs> default template for IVRs running asterisk. So he had a compressed DTMF string that he could play into an IVR and get it to read out the username and password <laughs> of all of the accounts allowed to edit the system. Awesome. And the phone came out. It, 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 he used his own voice, so it was hard for me to understand. But I, nothing to do with our game, but, uh, but you can make DTMF attacks. Yeah. It turns out it takes only about, I don't know, 50 milliseconds or something to get a digit through. Um, when did black badges start being awarded? Was it always eight? Uh, we got the first ones. Um, I think they were, I don't know actually when the black badges came out. The third time the team was huge because DT didn't have anywhere. I was saying they were, when the team was, I think the largest ever team was like 20 people. 20 odd people and DT standing there like with one black badge. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so he went and grabbed and he could like spare eight total. So That's hilarious. that became That's eight of us got black badges. The rest of them did not. Because we picked eight people for a team for we picked eight people for our team for the first year because you guys did. And you probably probably picked it because at some point he just had eight badges. That's kinda of funny. <laughs> eight teams, out. eight badges. Yeah. Well, out. Eight eight players. That eight was teams, that was based on that was also based on the like the table layout at the time. Like mm -hmm. there were like eight approximate seats without whatever. And so we basically decided that you couldn't have more than that at the table. I think also. it's still the same. We, we, yeah. we limit the size of the table just because of uh, just managing it all as a pain. Right. Which, I mean, doesn't really prevent large teams. Mm. But what it does do is gives large teams the same problem that large organizations in real life have, which is left hand, right hand communication problems and organizational problems. Because like 20 people sitting at a table can still kind of coalesce and like self-organize. Mm. But 20 people divided into two groups sitting in two different rooms can't. In the real world, you can buy a fractional T3 or, or buy a, you know, a, a private line and have it run and have somebody put up some VPNs and buy 
some keys and walk them over there and all these things. Here, you've got 48 hours to end the contest from the time you know where you're going to be. And getting a remote team connected is Yeah, limiting huge. the effectiveness of a large team was one of our, our driving ideas. Yep. Um, and the way we've done that is that we actually don't... When, when the game first started, like when, during DD Tech, they would just give you all the services immediately, except for maybe a few handful of excep exceptions. Now... We'll drop one service. So, sure, you have 50 people. Let all 50 people look at one service. Good luck. <laughs> right? Have fun. Limiting parallelism. Limit, yeah, li limiting parallelism is what we do. And then you know, maybe later we'll do you know, two, two more services. Yeah. So yeah, we never thought of anything like that. I wish, honestly, I wish we had because limiting, limiting team size was a huge motivator for us, too. For a certain team. <laughs> two, actually. Yeah, you, you and Shellfish. It's sort of interesting because it also plays into the sort of distribution in turn inside of a team, right? Like how many rock stars are there and how, how fast does it drop off and like what is the curve? We also started implementing what we do, uh, we patch a service. So like real world, we'll implement the basic functionality of a service and then maybe midday on Saturday, Change drop a completely it. new one yeah. and the original bug is patched. So now you have to pull the person who was originally the de facto expert on that, that service and they now have to do this new thing because... Do you really want to ramp up somebody else on, a new, on the same service or pull them? So, yeah, we've, we really spend a lot of time thinking about these game mechanics and, and how to make it um, more playable and useful for the real world. Yep. Uh, so how many women have participated? I know that um, uh, More Smoke Leet Chicken has at least had female participation. Um, unfortunately, not enough. We had yeah. more than 25% every year that we played. Wow. Uh, we we uh, did not try to make a conscious inclusion of people. We picked the best people we knew, and in Seattle, that's a mixed group. We had women with us, uh, not a huge percentage, but we had women with us every year with School of Root. Imagine they just don't want to yeah. smell us. We start stinking after a day. Part participation participation wise, there have been a lot of mixed teams, um, but by far, it's obviously uh, been been lopsided. Yeah. yeah. What about as organizers? Uh, so uh, lighting. Uh, uh, her name is Jewel. She, the person who wrote this. Well, again, yeah. just a full Phenomenal. style. Phenomenal <laughs> yeah, piece yeah, like custom a, architecture implemented by a woman for absolutely. Yeah, we're yeah. not looking for a winner. I'm just. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no that's, we found one. That's you weren't but, looking for it, but we found it. Yeah, we, we found, found the winner of CTF yeah, exactly, and it is apparently lightning. Um, I feel like just putting this up here, even though it's clearly a troll. But Frank wants to know, he's hacked the Gibson and only got a partial download of the garbage file. So can you help him look through it? You, you I think there's a like person in the audience who does not know what this means, and we just it's found like, this out right before we walked into this room. I think you need hack a fusion shot right? or a rabbit hack or hack planet. the planet or something. Blank, blank, yeah. blank, right? Blank, blank, blank. It. Yeah. Like, blank, blank, blank. It's like the only question that's been posted that wasn't anonymous, so I felt like I had to actually put it up there. <laughs> Um, so here's a curious question, at least to me. Uh, did you do dry runs, and like how many people would participate so in the dry run? If you did, do we dry never run, had time. We can't. Well, time plus <clears throat> we can't do dry one, right? We did because we really only trust ourselves. We did dry runs of individual services. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. So the the, the idea of the like dry run <clears throat> thing of like here other member of Kinshoto or whatever like try and solve this challenge, but other than that, no way. beta testing, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, unit unit testing and not integration or systems testing. No. Like the system goes systems online. Like, on day at the real game, we didn't test them. Yeah, exactly. And we had to make changes like like last second all the time, like every year. Yeah, we did it as well. I mean, we did it for our, all of our automated polling, scoring, all of that stuff. I mean, the second part of the question doesn't make sense to me. Right? How do you stop any info? That's an opsec thing. Well, that's why we yeah. didn't well, I allow think outside a, run. Assuming like, that there was did, no full like, some sort of beta run or something, yeah, that yeah, like, more people have. It uh, we like didn't have. No it was way. only team. No right? It wasn't like we opened it to public beta or something no like way. that. <laughs> it was. It was only our internal dev team. Yeah. So, no, so it, it's probably case, one of the reasons code hasn't sense. even transacted from hand to hand. Really, yeah. is is just because we all feel like, at least I think we felt like we wanted to play Miles's game, and then. Once we kind of got on the inside, we didn't want to be tainted. We didn't want to taint anybody else. We wanted all of our friends to be able to enjoy the game that they love. Yep. Totally. Good. Five. No, we're done. Okay. The program says another nine minutes, but we can be done if you want us to. <laughs> <laughs> My beer is empty. <laughs> Mine too. All right, last last no question beer. then. Let's go. Uh, what qualities do you admire most in the teams that compete? Fury. 
Like, there are teams that just, like, throw down, and they don't do anything else. They don't sleep. They don't eat. Do you remember the Mad Swedish Passion. Packers? Yes. I, gotta say, like, I admire no whining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, as, as an organizer, that, that becomes a big problem. I agree. Like, that's a, that's a big issue. But yeah, just the say, fury, the thing. passion of it. Like the fact that you can go and you spend, you know, 12 hours, 10 hours in front of a PC, and then you go and spend all night in front of you know, doing the same thing, it's pretty hardcore. Like, like I'm all of it. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, the endurance. The, it, it really is at some point an endurance feat. You know what's funny is <laughs> thinking about that is you're, right now the, the cost entry is, well, they get free entry now. I don't, it wasn't when you guys was the case, but they get eight badges for, per team. But before, when you'd have to pay... We didn't even get badges. Oh yeah, when you pay, you go and you you we come here, like especially people coming from far away, like Russia and Japan, and they spend their entire weekend in front of a computer. The exact same thing they do at home, but they come in here and do it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aside from that, the thing that always shocked me as an organizer, time to solve is the thing that I always looked at. Right, mm-hmm. Some, something drops like radically faster than you expected. It, yeah. that, oh, yeah. That's like an instant. That's frightening wow. sometimes. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, and the level, it's not just the stamina and like, yeah, I can drink a bunch of Mountain Dew. It's the, I put in the 10 months getting to this. That's true. A lot of people bring, like, now you have to bring custom stuff. Like, for right. example, when he was mentioning that if you pull a flag and you don't encrypt it, it's going to get caught. Because, oh, that's one thing we mentioned too is that people, the, all the teams have access to the packet captures. So they see all the data coming across the network and they control what's coming in and out of the box. So um, if you don't encrypt your, or, your data back and forth in your shell code. Your shell code has to implement this encryption. Then you're going to fail. All right. You, you have something? Uh, uh, just just one of the oh, things in time time to crack. Uh, I don't know if it was you guys. Uh, one of our routers leaked one bit <laughs> of information, and the scoreboard had a different TTL off by one. <laughs> from the I remember. No, that was that was I remember. Was that, that, that was us? Yeah. Was that you guys? Yeah. Uh, the TTL we could, we could, on the packets. basically we could tell we could tell apart the packets that were your engine testing that a service was online from everyone else. So they firewalled like, only the players. Nobody they else. One hundred percent SLA, zero percent defense. Yeah. It, and and I they think, did this in maybe I don't know maybe seven minutes from the time we handed them their discs. We, they were. Yeah, it we, was amazing. We profiled TTL and your user agents on your. Yeah. <laughs> we missed scripted. that one. We didn't. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got the, the cutoff, so um, the, the slides will be posted, and uh, the, the video will be posted, so let's uh, thank the panelists, and I suppose we'll be around for a little bit. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming.